So now everybody is talking about critical race theory. They're, they're beginning to talk about intersectionality and systemic oppression, concepts like white privilege. But I think what a lot of people don't understand is that it goes far, far, far beyond that. And basically take whatever word you'd like to, to take and then apply the word justice to that, to connect the two and make that connective. Right. Racial justice for critical race theory. Right. Yeah. And so now, you know, we're talking about something that is all encompassing, that there is no way that, that anyone doesn't participate in this. And that's climate justice. Climate justice. Yeah. That's the, I don't know a lot, if a lot of people realize, you know, everybody, I think everybody, I think is aware of climate change as a subject. And they're aware of there being a debate around it and the argument over whether or not there is a debate around it um, as it has progressed to that level. But there's a tangential project called climate justice, that, a tangential field of research called climate justice that looks at it from the same kind of perspective where you hear the word justice, you know, shoehorned in otherwise, you know, social justice, racial justice. Um, gender justice, whatever it happens to be. Right. So the same kind of mindset and the same kinds of researchers are now looking at the question of climate and climate change. So I guess that's two questions. And the way that there is justice and injustice around that, and what I would say is that same kind of relatively uh, poor understanding-based way that you often see around these things. You know, the, with racial justice, there's very little desire when you look at racial justice or critical race theory specifically as an approach to racial justice. There's very little interest in actually achieving what most people would recognize as justice. There's instead a redistribution scheme and a grift and a power grab. And mm. there's not a lot of rigorous research like empirical research. You think climate change, you think, oh, science. Mm -hmm. Scientists are weighing in on it. Scientists are looking to see if the climate is changing. Scientists are trying to answer the question. Scientists and engineers are trying to figure out what is it we should do about the nature of Earth's climate and how it is changing uh, in, in different ways, maybe catastrophically. What could be done? And everybody's thinking, oh, this is a scientific issue, scientific issue. Climate justice is done by sociologists. It is not a scientific issue. It is done by humanities majors. It's done by critical theorists. It's done by postmodernists. It's done by humanities faculty in universities and activists affiliated with that who like to say the word science but seem not to have anything like scientific chops behind them. So let's get a real quick definition of what climate justice actually is in terms of what they would understand right. it to be, and then how we would interpret that so, in a real-world context. So first of all, justice justice is, is where we should really start, which is right. figuring out how to make things fair. Right. When something is unfair, it's figuring out how to make them more fair. And so underneath justice is concepts of fairness. And so underneath climate justice are concepts of fairness with regard to both climate, but more importantly, to how the climate is changing mm. and what impacts that might have. So. A kind of paradigm example. I will, will point out um, in the many of the books about climate justice that are out there. You know the academic literature about it. It's it's very rare for them to say, "Oh, this is what climate justice means." Instead, they give you a page of ten different definitions that don't really agree with one another because it's a very vague thing. Big surprise. <laughs> they right. keep it vague. Right. Um, that it can mean a lot of different things. Uh, and it's approached from a lot of different angles. So it's not going to be easy to give a clean meaning of it. But kind of a paradigm example will set the stage. They say that, you know, certain countries in the world have polluted a great deal through the industrialization process and right. being um, in that, you know, advanced economy stage like the United States would be. Uh, we have cars, we have jets, we produce lots of energy, often using fossil fuels to heat our homes, etc and to provide electricity. And they would say, that well, these rich countries have enriched themselves and given themselves a lot of power and a lot of resources and a lot of wealth, whereas poorer countries have not had access to that and simultaneously have not polluted as much. But climate change affects everybody. So for example, you may have, if the climate's changing, you may have low-lying islands in the Pacific that will go underwater if the ice caps melt. Or you may have beaches 
you know, or river deltas or whatever that'll be destroyed as the ocean changes or whatever else, or mm -hmm. as weather patterns change, you may have something like the Horn of Africa become very much desert uh, instead of being able to support crops and, and populations. And their argument would be, well, those people didn't make the pollution that's causing the problem. Mm -hmm. That's an injustice against them. Mm -hmm. And the wealthier nations like the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, most of, of, of Europe, um, probably Japan, those countries have industrialized China, but they usually wouldn't name China, um, <laughs> or <laughs> they don't. Um, these countries have enriched themselves and therefore have created lots of pollution that will harm people that weren't even enriched by it, didn't even get the benefits of it, as, as their argument would be. And that's an injustice. So we now have to figure out a way to redistribute resources from the West to the rest of the world. Usually the global South is named in particular mm -hmm. um, because of this particular injustice. So climate justice then becomes a way of analyzing these circumstances around how climate change might be affecting different regions of the globe and populations within those regions and how to make it more fair. In other words, specifically how to redistribute resources and opportunity, whether that's, oh, well, well, we'll give relief, we'll give money, or we'll give open access for immigration. Mm -hmm. um, you deserve the, the, the privileges and rights and access to Western countries because they've enriched themselves mm -hmm. at your peril. These are the kinds of kind of policy proposals that they tend to make. Um, for me, climate justice is a shift away from any scientific priority to asking, answering, investigating the question and to the degree that it's necessary or even whether necessary prudent to try to address that which can be known about the problem. It's a shift away from that, knowing what's really going on and trying to take prudent steps to do something about it into a very radical form of redistribution activism by people who don't actually know how the systems they're complaining about work. Primarily, like I said, sociologists and humanities professors who um, I suppose want to feel important by talking about a big and fashionable topic when they're right. not actually qualified to do so. Right. And so the first mention or appearance of the word climate justice, I believe it was in a 1999 Corp Watch article. Mm -hmm. That was the first official uh, introduction of it. And it wasn't all together at that point. Right. But now... It's not all together now. <laughs> I think we... I mean, there are different branches of it. We don't have right. to dive into it yet. We may sh maybe should. But right. there are materialist branches. There are... Which which are going to look at the material conditions. Right. Um, that can be done in a way that's more or less Marxist. It could be very Marxist or it could be absolutely not Marxist. It could be entirely capitalist, as a matter of fact, mm. looking at material conditions and like, how do we build up these nations to get them to a place where they're able to weather the storm better, increase their resources base, increase their infrastructure without putting them on the, the you know, 100 years of coal path. You know, there are, so there are, there are interpretations like that that are within the material spe materialist spectrum, but then there are critical theory uh, perspectives that are rooted directly in critical theory. Correct. And then there are postmodern perspectives that are, for lack of a better way to put it, batshit insane. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely anti-science, as a matter of fact, which if you actually, I'd, I've never been able to figure this out. If you actually care about climate change, if that's a make or break issue for you, supporting something that is openly anti-science just is a mind melter for me. Mm -hmm. um, and aggressively anti-science, as a matter but of fact. But it's aggressively anti-science. Why? Well, postmodernism in general is anti-science because it believes that science is just one story among many. It's one way to take the experience of the world, not, e not, not even data. Mm -hmm. Data are some kind of experience of the world, but it's just one kind of experience of the world. Again, the same pattern. So it's the way to take the experience of the world and tell a story about it. But there's no reason to privilege the story of science, of glaciology, of climatology, of meteorology, of atmospheric chemistry. There's no reason to priv privilege those stories, or of carbon chemistry in general, no reason to privilege those stories over the indigenous relationship to a glacier. Right, or, which is where you got started to, or, down this path. Yes, or feminist <laughs> art projects about glaciers, literally right. art projects, or interpretive dance, or, you know, narratives about how you feel about 
the changing climate and how awful it might be and how you feel like you're 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 responsible for taking part in or complicit in some horrible evil it's it's anti-science because it sees all approaches to knowledge postmodernism in general so also postmodern climate justice sees all approaches to knowledge as being kind of on a level but not mm -hmm. so no one has any reason to be privileged over others they would say but this one science has been unfairly privileged so it has it's going to have to be brought down some pegs while all the others are lifted up pegs so it's a willful tilting mm -hmm. of the playing field away from science and toward not science which makes it anti-science by by design um so this is this is generally how postmodernism thinks it just thinks that all claims on knowledge are actually assertions of power to be very fair very nuanced their argument is you can't possibly have a scientist without having a social process that authenticates them as a scientist. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to stamp the approval and say, yep, scientist, you get a degree in physics, you get a degree in, in atmospheric chemistry, you get a degree in climatology or whatever. Somebody had to approve that. And so apparently their politics, according to postmodernism, have leaked into that way of thinking about the world. And they just reproduce that political stance, whereas other potentialities are ignored and denigrated or excluded right. or marginalized. So um, that's why postmodern approaches are going to be explicitly anti-science. Critical approaches are going to try to just tear things apart and make people unhappy yeah. and try to point out the unfairnesses without ever actually talking. Remember, there's a divorce between critical theory and, and traditional theory. Traditional theory would be uh, attempting to understand the world. Critical theory is attempting to change the world. And I, we can get into the exact details of how it's a critical theory, in fact. But Marx's conception there is where critical theory came from. Some people want to try to understand the world. Some people want to change the world. So the critical theory is how do we take action now? How do we make social activists who, because critical theory doesn't have to know how things work, it doesn't have to know traditional theory, aren't even going to be informed on, you know, well, what are the complex relationships between, you know, human flourishing in business and immigration they, they don't care about any of that they want to point at the problems they want to make a, no, a lot of noise about the problems and then if you make enough noise everything will be will fix itself contradictions and then one of the things that we experienced uh we were in london together in 2019 <laughs> during the time that we were doing a conference in london and extinction rebellion basically was given a free pass to take over london shut <laughs> everything down yeah. but the curious thing is that and not even not even for climate change not even for climate change well, one of their gonna run into it one of their founders me, me. wrote it on the blog well and, and the thing is is that if you took a look at all of the major tenets of extinction rebellion which was focused on climate change it basically mirrored a lot of the same things that black lives matter originally stated that they were yep right yeah they, and then they said in the, the, one of the creators of Extinction Rebellion on his blog wrote that it, it's not about um, it's not about climate change. It's about power. It's about gaining the power to enact their their vision. And so that's what Extinction Rebellion was about. And you know, you say it's like Black Lives Matter. Well, it is. This is the same model. It's the woke model, as we might call it, which is to say that it's taking aspects of postmodern activism and taking aspects of critical theory activism, combining them into one thing and yelling about justice a lot. That's right. what woke really is. Right. And so the Black Lives Matter model and the, the Extinction Rebellion model are the same model. They're just talking about different things with different buzzwords, different jargon, and largely doing the same kinds of behaviors. Um, lots of performance art. There's your postmodernism. We saw that in Extinction Rebellion, you know, people like flopping around and doing, the people walking in the, the weird outfits, like, you know, like, Weird monks and like red a religious robes and their priestess, yeah, kind of and their thing. faces yes. painted, and they had the funny hats. I walked with them and twirled around, and you know, kind of made fun of that. Um, well, when you have the very serious stuff, you know, that's one form of performance art. When you have people like flailing around and dancing around in the street like chickens, like literally, we saw that too. Like people literally acting like animals and rolling around in the road. That's what Judith Butler would have had. Is um, mm -hmm. it's politics of parody. It's activism by acting very bizarrely like they're very dramatically you know kind of drawing attention to themselves uh in a parodic form of their own destruction and death because we're killing the planet and blah 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 this is straight out of the same playbook it's the same playbook um 
because it's the same model, and that model is the combination of postmodern elements and um, critical theory elements. It's the same model that you said that I got started in all this. That was from the feminist glaciology paper. Same model that was in, in a much more academic sense behind that ridiculous paper. Um, and so, yeah, the, the relationships between Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, um, the not all of gay pride, but the queer, the vibrantly queer and meaning queer theory activism within it, um, hmm. that all has the same set of playbooks. You know, go at those guys that you saw with, you know, with, with Black Lives Matter, in fact, and the police would come out and some guy would go out in like rainbow shorts and twerk in the road. Mm -hmm. That's same thing. The exact same thing. It's the same introduction of performance art. And, you know, there are people maybe in these communities, whether it's Black Lives Matter or people, you know, around London who are going to, who have noticed, you know, that's not going to solve the problem. Right. And with climate change, it's even more stark. Like I said, people see that and they're like, shouldn't somebody be doing some calculations somewhere? You know, shouldn't, shouldn't right. we be figuring out how, if carbon in the atmosphere is the problem, shouldn't we be figuring out how to put it back in the ground? Right. You know, shouldn't somebody be doing that instead of dancing like a chicken? But that's what I said. It's a distraction from any possibility, whether you believe that it's a problem that's very severe and needs serious action, whether you think it's a problem we should at least investigate and be prudent about. I think most people agree that we should prudence at least, right? Like, well, yeah, let's take a look mm -hmm. and let's be at least prudent. Even, you know, the people that are like denialists. Right. Prud no, I've never heard anybody denounce prudence right and so actual research actual, actual science. actual research and then let's and, and i've never heard anybody actually take to denounce let's take steps to a cleaner planet except for you know young guys who are just being stupid or whatever right. you know they're just being wild or whatever they're they'll grow out of it and they're also not serious professionals um it's not like you know that's not what's really going on most people are like yeah a cleaner environment is a win-win no matter what so right why not, you know, but we're distracting from potential serious solutions with people dancing like chickens because you have people who are very worked up about a problem that they're not qualified to solve. And they've been turned into a, a form of critical activist that's basically not really good for anything except doing that. I think it's a big distraction from solving the real problem, but then this is where the critical theory gets really relevant because what's critical theory about? We go back to Horkheimer, He's the first systematic explanation of critical theory in 1937, traditional and critical theory, or maybe it's critical and traditional theory. I always mix those things up. Um, and he lays out, it's been summarized by other philosophers, is lays out a map of what makes a theory a critical theory versus a traditional theory. What makes it alchemy rather than science in kind of more plain terms? And the answer is that a critical theory must have a normative vision for the world moral vision for the world. It has this picture of a perfect world or a better world at least, but usually a perfected world. Mm -hmm. the, we're in sustainable development goals. That's in climate justice, right? Sustainable. The, sustainable is the, the normative vision here. Everything's sustainable. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, we have, you know, zero emissions. We have a completely carbon circular economy to the degree that we rely right. on carbon. Um, so they have a vision. And then what you do is you have to be able, in critical theory, you have this vision, and then you compare everything in the existing world against that vision and point out where it's either failing that vision or it's not according to your perception on a path that will get you to that vision. You criticize, in Marx's word, words, everything ruthlessly. Mm. The ruthless criticism of everything that exists. That was Marx's actual statement. And that's what the critical theorists imported. And so that's where you're going to engage in that dialectical process of pointing out the contradictions and tearing things down um, that, they, that the critical theory school is about. And then the third aspect of a critical theory, and they're just three. Number one, normative vision. Number two, how does the world today fail to head toward that vision or to meet that vision? Number three, it must create the ability for what Marx called praxis, which is to put theory into practice. In other words, to generate social activists who will act on that behalf. And so that's what you, that's what, that's why you see climate justice generating extinction rebellion. And you see in perfect parallel, um, racial justice generating Black Lives Matter. It's the same idea. Exactly. And so we were listening to a, a lecture, a, a TED talk 
yeah. uh, on climate justice the other day together. And there was this whole discussion eventually came to the point where the woman tried to define climate justice as the intersection yeah. of economics, of climate change, and of social justice. That's right. And so, again, you're now bringing in intersectionality. And then she mentioned the word right. again. Well, I mean, a lot of people don't wouldn't know, obviously, that climate justice actually has profound roots in what's called ecofeminism. Mm -hmm. And one of the primary aspects of climate justice is gender justice within the relevance of climate. So we had right. that argument earlier. The northern countries, the rich western democracies produce to the detriment of these other countries that are not receiving the benefit of that, which isn't a totally accurate argument, but of course we just covered- It's a question of privilege. Yes. So you have this northern world or advanced democracy privilege, and um, what they say also, it's an exact mirror image. It's the same argument like the, you know, they say in the Chinese, they like microcosms of the bigger thing down to the smaller thing. They say, well, men engage in more of the activity, more of economic activity that produces uh, carbon particulates and carbon gases in the atmosphere and CO2 and methane in particular being the two relevant ones. Men partic participate in this and benefit from it more, whereas women are going to be the most affected. Right. Women most affected, you know, terrible thing happens to everybody, women most affected. That's the, that's the joke meme about how feminism analyzes everything. But they say men gain more benefit, mm -hmm. you're taking, then they produce more of the carbon, they're taking more trips on jets, etc. They say the same thing about wealthy versus poor. The wealthy have 10 times the carbon footprint as uh, the poor, uh, of course. But they're also producing a lot more of the, um, the, the prosperity of the world, right. which kind of, you know, the poor in wealthy nations are, of course, poor, and it's not to, to say anything bad about somebody's circumstances, but they're better off than the middle in a really bad country, mm -hmm. right? So the ships do rise together. They just don't all rise evenly. Um, so they make the same argument. So men produce more, their women more affected. And so there's a huge gender dimension. So gender justice is baked into uh, climate justice. Wealth justice, AKA communism, is baked into climate justice. We have to figure out how to fix those wealth disparities because the wealthy are producing more of the pollutants. The wealthy are benefiting more from it. The poor are benefiting less while producing less and will have the hardest impact. They're always probably correct in saying that people who have fewer resources will feel the brunt of things the most. Mm -hmm. That's probably true. Right. Um, so, but this, this is the argument at the heart of their whole justice claim. You see it with the racial justice as well. And racial justice is also baked into uh, climate change or climate justice because they say, of course, well, look at the different places that are going to be affected the most. Are they white Western nations, European nations? No. I mean, they, they neglect to point out at times like that, for example, that it's projected if the climate change is as bad as some scientists warn, that the entire su southeastern United States will basically be turned semi-arid to completely arid, which seems like it's a bad deal for the people that live there. They don't talk about that. They say, no, 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 no. White people are all going to be fine. Brown and black people are going to be decimated by, and therefore there's a racial element to it. They don't analyze the details very well. Right. They just pick, you know, some place like Myanmar or Bangladesh or some valley in India or something like this, and then say, look, this is how bad it'll be there. And brown and black people, they just hasty, hastily generalize, brown and black people all over the world will therefore be destroyed by this. Um, and while white people obviously will just be perfectly fine for magical uh, racial justice reasons. Right. Um, but once again, it's, it's basically the same concept. It's the same game going on. It's same, 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 same. Right. Whether it's about wealth, therefore communism, whether it's about this, whatever it is with racial justice, ethno-communism really, reparations of some kind, whether it's with uh, one country versus another, so therefore like immigration or national, uh, right. national origin or status uh, justice, whether it's across gender. And I mean, we saw the other video, we, we talked about the feminist glaciology, we watched the feminist Glacier TED Talk video as well, right. and in that video she also points out, you know, oh well, the women, you know, women most affected. Uh, so the gender aspect is baked in. In, in one of the a prominent climate justice textbook, they have, you know, all these different things. And they have an entire unit 
to gender and climate justice and an entire unit to race and climate justice. And I think most of a unit to immigration and climate justice. And then these things are always referred to as global challenges that mm -hmm. need global solutions. Right. That in, in, and I would make this point too, is that whenever we're talking about things about social justice, climate justice, critical race theory, any of these things, is there's always a accompanied aspect of anti-nationism um, yeah, well, everybody has to get on the same. Everybody has to get on the same page. It's all going to be super. All the countries have to participate together because Correct. it's a global problem. Meanwhile, the Western nations, because they've created more of the problem, they've benefited more of the problem, and they have the greatest means. Which I actually agree with that part. Should bear the brunt of of solving the problem. Okay, and I don't. I have to be more nuanced about right. that because this is, on the one hand, people who can af like, if we have to take expensive action to do something about something like the climate, if we have to. It's obvious that the centers of innovation and technology and the richest nations are going to be the ones that are going to be able to run, say, a climate Manhattan project that develops the technology that m might save the world. I mean, it's, it's, I don't mean to put any country down, but you don't really expect that Congo is going to come up with the advanced carbon technology that stops the problem, right? But what through their knowledges, though? Well, I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. So you just so to say that their knowledges are not correct. I am. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb and guess that it's going to be a major Western democracy that's going to come up with these technologies and that's going to end up funding them. And that's fine, but that's a means to pay, right? We have that capability. We see that there's action needed. It's another thing entirely to take that argument and leverage it into a redistribution scheme and say, oh, well, the West owes the rest of the world money. The West owes the rest of the world open borders so that people can now be, you know, refugees from their poor country or their their climate changing country, which is going to be a really vague, bar, you know, it's one thing if you're accepting refugees from a war, it's pretty clear when, I mean, it's not perfectly clear, but it's fairly clear when, you know, those criteria are going to be met. It's another thing when you're like, oh, the, the climate's changing, you know, right. The, the climate is really rough. So we have to be refugees. And of course, now the, the Western nations are going to have to just open their borders. But that's another argument altogether than um, obviously the major world powers and technological centers are the ones that are going to have the most innovation and probably should. Um, right. Two and, different arguments. And one of the other things that always comes along with this as well is the idea that we need to start to push away and to eliminate our reliance upon or our dietary needs, including meat. Yeah, the, the two big ones are the the, the meat-based agricultural industry right. and the fossil fuel industry. Correct. Those two are the really, really big ones. In fact, there's entire an entire unit in a lot of these books just on the fossil fuel industry. And you said it came from, what was it called where climate justice started? The something Corp, Corp Watch? Corp Watch, 1999. Corp yeah, what, what, corps, what corporations do you think they were watching? Oil, gas, etc. Yeah, yes. exactly. That's the, that's They're all bent on the fossil fuel industry. They think that the fossil fuel industry is running a giant conspiracy to just continue to maintain its um, ability to extract and generate wealth this way. And maybe there's some point to that argument to a degree. I would say that it's likely to be the case, but on the other hand, it's also a complex system. They don't have realistic solutions, right? Everybody eating a vegan diet is probably not a realistic solution to human nutritional needs. And support, uh, filling in the gap on whatever amount of animal protein, et cetera, that you need with things like mealworms and crickets is also, I mean, there's probably a reason that's not arbitrary that we don't eat a lot of mealworms and crickets. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gross on a level. And people have that, you know, reaction. And these aren't realistic solutions. You look at with the energy, you don't hear them say, oh, yeah, well, let's figure out how to shift to, you know, cleaner coal and minimizing coal and working off of coal and moving into, you know, cleaner natural gas. And then meanwhile amplifying our, our nuclear energy production and working to make renewables like, you know, wind and solar more effective. You don't hear this plan that might actually work in terms of tr an a transition of energy. You hear that we have to go to 100% renewables basically now. Mm -hmm. You don't hear people talk about technological solutions like closed loop, um, closed loop, I guess they're not fossil fuels at that point, but oil and, oil and gas where, for example, 
the Navy has the technology. It's it's a known technology. It's a developed technology that you can extract seawater. Right. You can pull the calcium carbonate out of it through a process that's about twice as expensive as the normal refinery mode. You can turn that into jet fuel. The Navy developed it to fuel right. uh, jets on aircraft carriers using their nuclear reactor for plenty of energy to do it. So it's not a cost problem. Why? Because you solve a supply chain problem. Right. Plus, it's all circular. Right. That, that carbon is, there's too much carbon in the ocean anyway. So you're pulling excess carbon out of the ocean, turning it into jet fuel, the jets fly. If that's the only way we had petroleum, oil products, was from seawater, that's closed loop. We're not pulling extra out anymore. And right. so they, you don't hear them talk about solutions like this. Nothing realistic. It's a brilliant idea. And, and if, if the cost of this process can be brought down. Of course. It's like the, the ignoring right now nuclear energy completely. Right. You could, get, you could make a completely closed loop system. Um, you would have local effects that you'd have to figure out how to deal with, just like when they try to do desalinization, but it's still a tractable potential solution. They don't talk about it. They don't talk about that. They say, no, we have to have windmill, solar, and batteries, and that's it right now. Well, you got to think about this. One fact of history, and this is, you know, students of history understand this, but very few people think about history this way. What is it that has made, if you look at, and I know you're not even allowed to say these, these nasty, dirty words, but if you look at the big empires of history, what is it that they had hmm. that made them the empires? Who were the, like the Dutch suddenly became an empire for a while. How? How did they become one of the most powerful European empires for a while? Turned out they had the most efficient access and to produce energy from wood, when wood was the most efficient right. energy source. That's right, then James. what? Coal. Right. And then all of a sudden, the coal-bearing places became the energy, the industrial, the smokestacks that we all think of how dirty everything was. That was people burning coal. And energy dominance leads to the ability to grow and prosper with externalities, of course, with costs. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to now say, aha, all you big Western nations, 100% renewables. Meanwhile, developing nations, nations like China and India, which are by no means small, both have nuclear weapons. Right. You can keep burning fossil fuels until you get up to scratch. Including, with the Western including smaller nations, such as those in South America, Central America, uh, in Africa. Now their dependence upon fossil fuels and so forth yeah. can be greater. Right. Now, if you are going to do that, though, if you are a student of critical theory and you know that the point of critical theory is to break the West... You break their possibility, their access to energy dominance. I mean, you talk about screwing around with wealth. That's one thing. You talk about screwing around with culture. That's another. You break energy dominance. You break the West. Mm -hmm. And if the West can't defend its values, Western values are gone. Right. Western civilization is going to end. And right. so climate justice becomes a pretext very strongly argued for, although not explicitly in the terms of let's take down the West, of... Um, Doing exactly that, usually in some grotesque name like democratizing energy, mm -hmm. democratizing food, democratizing, uh, you know, immigration status or whatever. Right. Democratizing, democratizing. So, but what you do is you end up taking the, the really the, the competence of what is here in the West and you immediately move it to other, other nations and allow those to quickly develop out of need. Right. You know, because without On that, an argument that this is justice. Right. That all of the effort, all of the work, all of the, the blood, sweat, and tears, all of the uh, risks, all of the investment, all of the things that people throughout the West have done, all of the granted good fortune that, that the scientific revolution took place in Europe, uh, but all of the work that followed from that, all the scientists, all the engineers, all of these people um, who took these, these steps, put in this work and effort to build up this great prosperity, not even just nationally, but across many nations in what we refer to as the developed world. Now, all of a sudden, we have to just figure out a way to dump that into places, other places while crippling ourselves in terms of, of, of our, our energy economy. Um, it's very difficult not to see this as a, as a, again, if you understand critical theory, as a plot to undermine Western hegemony in the world yep. yet again, which is what they, Western hegemony is the target of critical theory. It is the thing they came into existence while China, to take apart. With, while China, with its dominant hegemony, I yeah. mean, muscular hegemony is, is taking the Belt Road Initiative and the digital road, um, digital Silk Road throughout 
most of the Middle East and Asia and up and down Africa, even South America now, and now extending into Europe. And so while we're doing this, we are weakening uh, the United States, we're weakening much of the European Union. And in essence, it's almost like Ibram Kendi X's is his whole idea of making sure that you're discriminatory to the the white and to those with white privilege in order to practice your anti-racism work that's what's necessary that same philosophical concept is being imposed right now to western nations right yeah. you know is that kendi's you, argument is that past discrimination has to be fixed by present the discrimination. discrimination so who's being discriminated against yeah, in this exactly. case in a in a national level Exactly. Civilizational level. Yeah. So this is a huge heist is what right. climate justice is. And again, I just have to keep making this point. I know it's a bit tangential to the heist thing and the global, but being run by people who aren't qualified to do it. Correct. It is a way to, it's also a grift. It is a way to empower people to talk about an issue like climate change with global significance, to put them on gigantic stages with massive levers of power who have no business talking about this because they think, for example, coming out of the feminist glaciology paper, they think, for example, and this is a real example in the paper, they talk about, oh, you know, you have the satellite photos of glaciers and right. you see the retreat in advance of the glaciers over time during the seasons and everything else. And are they getting right. bigger? Or are they getting smaller? And you have actual satellite data and they say, glaciologists study this. Well, there's a feminist who's a painter and she paints pictures that look like that. And they don't include the pictures that she paints along the satellite, along with the satellite data. That's in the feminist glaciology paper. That person doesn't get a seat at the table. That person, I'm glad she's making paintings and if somebody wants to buy the paintings and hang them in the wall, or if she thinks it's wrong to sell paintings for profit and wants to give them to people, awesome. Bring light into the world, I love art. And if that looks, if, if it looks right. like something somebody wants, it doesn't have to look good, that's so, to some level subjective. subjective. Great. But it's not glaciology. You have no seat at the glacier table because you painted a picture of a glacier. Mm. You have no seat there. Um, and, and that whole paper is designed around the idea that glaciology only favors one type of story. They only favor the white Western scientific story that's rooted in masculinism and in scientific reasoning and objective beliefs that objective truth are, are, are is accessible or relevant. And we should be incorporating the subjective, the story, the narrative. Right. So, so you start creating subjective narratives that include teenage girls that have no knowledge on the subject at all, that are just emotional and script reading and right. so forth. I've been, con I mean, to, to summarize, you know, I've been convinced that this is something that I have to be extraordinarily emotional about. Here's me wailing into a TikTok. I guess give me a Nobel Prize in chemistry or something. Put you on the cover of Time magazine. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, so what is our answer to this? I mean, you and I, we'll, we have some differences, you know, in terms of how we view um, the subject of climate and climate change and of so course. forth. But how do we... But that's we... not relevant because right. you and I believe that we can find objective exactly. answers. Exactly. The kryptonite of all of these justice movements is the demand for evidence. Right. Like... What's it, your proof for that? Exactly. Show the receipts. Mm -hmm. Show the receipts. Where's what? It, what does the science say? Can it? Can it? Can it withstand the scrutiny? Can it withstand the scrutiny? And then you know how it's also you have to take into it. And I hate to I hate to dip into complexity and say it's complicated because it's not that. But this, if you're talking about something global, something like it touches economy, energy, you know, human interactions, technology, all these different things, you have to admit that there are a lot of things, right? So if you decide we're gonna change our entire energy sector yeah. and put a bunch of windmills up, you've got to be ready and we're gonna you know, turn off the, the power plants and we're gonna put up a bunch of windmills. You have to be ready to, to figure out a way to continue to meet the needs of the people who depend on that energy, energy grid. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, oh yeah, windmills will do it because as we just saw in Texas, yeah. they freeze. Sometimes they freeze right. and they don't work or sometimes, you know, Whatever else happens, the wind doesn't blow. This isn't an aesthetic argument. It isn't about if they're ugly or, or if they're killing birds, which is another thing, actually, if you're talking about environmental stuff. But um, it's an argument about just practicalities. The many practicalities of these, these things have to be accounted for. And the different 
to use their word, stakeholders and the right. the real stakeholders, not the pretend stakeholders, have to be able to say, no, this matters to me. And you can't use this concept of bogus justice to tilt who's a legitimate stakeholder and who's not. Because if your power's out in freezing weather in Texas where your house is lightly insulated, you can freeze to death. Right. Right. Those are that's that's a legitimate claim on the stakes. Real world real world concern. Yeah. Yeah. So what you have to do about it is, again, I think that you have to demand evidence. You have to demand realistic solutions, not just these kind of very passionate rhetorical arguments about this and that. And if it is true that there are going to be concerns like, oh, you know, the way that for whatever reason the climate is changing in the Horn of Africa is going to cause migrations, making plans for that is smart, right? But we should be focused on practical solutions that are based in evidence and that take prudent steps that try to, prudent steps are not revolutionary steps, right? We should be taking prudent steps to try to make things better. And again, like real solutions. Are you talking about nuclear power? Are you actually trying to solve the problem or are you trying to leverage something for power? And what we have to do to solve the problem is we have to be willing to start figuring out which side of the thing you're arguing about. Are you trying to turn a important technical question into a almost quasi-religious moral imperative because right. that's not actually helping. That's right. That's right. And so basically you're looking at a period where systems are being changed. Right. Everywhere. And so even if certain systems work. Even if they work, right. doesn't matter because they aren't meeting that normative vision. Right. Right. They haven't got us, as Marcuse says in Repressive Tolerance, no society on earth is ready to practice liberating tolerance. No society on earth does it yet. And so none of them are up to the, to the, to the normative standard of critical, he was a critical theorist. None of them are up to the, the, the normative standard of certain historical possibilities in his words that have become considered utopian possibilities. He means communism. Mm -hmm. um, historical possibilities from a, Mar a neo-Marxist, what would that mean, you know? Mm -hmm. Marx's progress of history, uh, okay, <laughs> got you. So you, we do though, we have to be able to call a spade a spade. We have to be able to tell who's on which side of this. And I am all about, at the very minimum, taking prudent and maybe even somewhat aggressive action, depending on what the data bear out, regarding the issues relevant to the atmosphere and the, its effects that it may have on, on global climate. And I am 100% about us doing rigorous research. I mean, NASA's right over here. They should be doing right. rig rigorous research into this. I mean, NASA leads some of the way in um, you know, doing climate research. And then we should be trying to find practical solutions. What we don't need is a distraction, people demanding to be at the table who have no, no business at the table because what they're doing is in and of itself maybe fine, but it's not the thing. And so we have to have people steal their spines, really. I keep calling it steel spined liberalism. We have to get people to steal their spines and say, you know, no, we're going to use rigorous methods. We're going to be serious about this. We're going to put forth practical solutions. And your, your whining and histrionics um, isn't welcome here. It's not helpful. And if you actually care about the issue, you need to, to step back. This is the problem. Environmentalism you know, racial justice, Black Lives Matter as an organization itself, they all get co-opted by these radical critical theorist type people. They all get co-opted by it and get turned into something that cannot achieve and doesn't even attempt to achieve its original mission and instead just tries to make system change where the way that, the way the system changes is, is, is achieved is by just putting these people in power. Don't worry, they'll have a new system for you. Right. Uh, don't ask too many questions because that would be racist. Put us in power. Mm -hmm. Rule by the technocrats as opposed to a democratic solution where we say someone makes the case to us and says, look, these are real problems. This is a real issue and it's been tested and we've, we've had our arguments. We've had our open debates about this. What are we going to do? That's what it's going to go to, too, is rule by technocrats. What's the difference between what is a technocrat? Rule by experts. Correct. And I put experts in quotes for a reason. Right. Because like with COVID, right, Tony Fauci is the expert. But you listen to the guy. You listen to the guy who invented the what's it called the PCR test right. before he died. 
Right. He, he had this whole spiel he did about Fauci, about how he's more of a bureaucrat. He's playing the game, the public figure game. Right. He's, he's not, I'm not saying he doesn't have scientific credentials, but he's no Francis Collins. He's, you know, right. he, he's, he's not a huge, successful scientist expert. And the way that his narrative shifts in the wind and, and all of this stuff is, he's, he's more of a politician. And so that's what you end up with is actually rule by people. Every scientist who ends up getting power fails usually to realize how corruptive power becomes and staying in that spotlight and having that power and influence. And that's the thing that technocracy runs on. Technocracy runs on corrupted scientists or corrupted experts, not actual experts. Ones who could grift their way in, ones who, and it, you make a more griftable system like this justice nonsense. Oh, well, we have to bring in an equity expert who has an MBA, but no, no technical degrees. The ethnomathematics, the main researcher in the ethnomathematics, um, Rochelle Gutierrez, mm -hmm. she has no degrees in mathematics, but she's going to redesign mathematics from the ground up. This is the kind of thing that we have to start saying no to because that's technocracy and that's where we're screwed. By the way, I have to, you know, you'll find this maybe a little surprising. What Foucault and Lyotard, the postmodernists, right. yes. were warning about right. was technocrats. Absolutely. That's what Foucault's criticism isn't about science. That's where it went wrong. That's why he's useful for some things, but not for others. That's right. And, but he is. He has the best criticism of technocracy in print, of biopower, he called it. And so what we have to do is we're going to have to draw from that, but we're also going to have to, like I said, you just have to say no more of this. Right. This is nonsense, and it's not helpful, it's not useful, it's not the relevant material. And when you want to start, anybody who can do the relevant stuff and get to the table, fine, but we're not going to give, um, I don't even know what to call it, like a, a scholastic handicap or score or something because somebody's using the buzzword justice. Right. And I think both of us, to conclude, would say that we are for clean air and for clean water. We are for clean environments. We are for healthy environments, no matter where they be. I think Whether we're also against the desertification of the planet, if that's... Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. But also to allow it, to be able to allow people to have the volitional abilities to to, to be sovereign in guiding their own destiny and not under the rule of somebody else that has another plan in place That's right. that they're not aware of. That's right. And so to be able to, to still succeed, um, to be able to flourish in that way is something that now some will be allowed to flourish and some will not. You, you have to avoid the tyrant. You have to avoid the tyrant. It's so important to avoid the tyrant because you say... For five minutes, you say, wait a minute, if we all were forced to participate in this and we all did it right, maybe we, we could succeed. But the problem is, is we just said it, power corrupts. And so when you hand over that power, you hand over the keys to your life, you're not getting it back. Your freedom is going and the more you give away, the harder it is to get back. And so when we talk about their word stakeholders, us as free and sovereign citizens should have a stake in maintaining our freedom and our individual sovereignty, and nations should also.